Think about it from a business perspective. How many different ways can cash be treated? Or just think about it as ourselves. All right, so if I come up and I give Cameron 100 bucks, how does he treat that $100? An asset. It's an asset to you, but it's also a gift. So you didn't do anything to earn it. Um, it's just a gift that was given. Now, if you come and cut my grass and I pay you 100 bucks, then you earned revenue. So you still treat it as cash, but there's also revenue that's associated with it. Whereas if I just give you the 100 bucks, it's considered a gift. Um, I could give you $100 as a loan. If I give you 100 bucks and say, hey, I'm gonna give you $100, but in a month's time, I expect you to pay me back 110 or 125. So in that case, he, he still receives cash, but associated with that cash is gonna be a liability because he's gonna have to pay me back hundred dollars plus interest and then um, you could also get a hundred dollars by selling something okay so say that you have I don't know a pair of shoes that you want to sell so you go and you sell those shoes you receive a hundred dollars but then also in the process you get rid of an asset you gain an asset in cash but you get rid of an asset so cash can be covered in a multitude of ways. Each of those scenarios that we just mentioned would have to be recorded differently for journal entry purposes. All right, so when you think about a company and the same thing could happen with them, um, except on a much larger scale and many more times over, um, how do companies treat cash? All right, so we've covered three financial statements so far. And in the order they're, they're to be prepared, the income statement goes first, okay? The income statement lists all revenues, all expenses, and then once revenues and expenses are listed, we are either left with a net income, if revenue is greater than expense, or a net loss, if expenses are greater than revenue, okay? Then where does this number flow into? You might remember what's the next financial statement that is to be completed? Capital. Mm -hmm. So capital's involved. It's a statement of owner's equity. Okay, so the statement of owner's equity is next. On well, the statement of owner's equity, we start with beginning owner's equity. We add in anything that would increase owner's equity which would be contributions or capital investments in the company. Net income would be that as well. So it would go directly into the statement of owner's equity. Then we take out anything that might decrease owner's equity. So owner's drawing. Okay. And then what we're left with at the end of the statement of owner's equity is ending owner's equity. Okay. Where does ending owner's equity go? It goes to the balance sheet. The balance sheet is the third financial statement that we talked about. And the ba balance sheet flows in the accounting equation order. So you start with assets, <coughs> then you list liabilities, and then lastly is our ending owner's equity. And you remember assets equals Liabilities plus owner's equity. All right, so where does cash flows fit into that, um, into these? So one of the assets is obviously cash. And ending cash goes to the statement of cash flows. Now the statement of cash flows, it shows how did they use their cash? So obviously all of the inflows of cash, so all the ways that they made money, as well as outflows of cash, is gonna be, they're gonna show up on the statement of cash flows, okay? And there's a lot of different things that companies can gain from the statement of cash flows. So are they making money with their business? Can they maintain and uh, keep their business ongoing? If they have negative cash flow, or if they're spending more cash than they're bringing in, 
then there might be a concern that they could continue as a company uh, if they want to expand, possibly. Um, you would be able to get a lot of information from the statement of cash flows there. Can they meet their financial obligations? If they have a lot of liabilities and they owe money to creditors, but they don't have cash flowing in, then there's a possibility they might not be able to meet financial obligations. And then lastly, pay a dividend. <clears throat> so a dividend, if you have a stock that's publicly traded, uh, one of the incentives that you might offer is um, to pay a dividend on your shares. So when I worked at Windstream, which is, it's kind of like AT&T, our stock I believe was like $8 a share. But each quarter, they would offer a 25 cent dividend. Okay, so if you held on to Windstream stock for a year, you'd be guaranteed a dollar a share. So the return on that $8 stock was pretty good. And so it was always highly traded, um, had a great dividend. I don't believe it's doing so well now. I haven't looked, which I haven't worked there in seven years. But um, at the time, whenever I worked there, their dividend was very strong. And so because of that dividend, a lot of people wanted to invest in that company. All right, now that dividend obviously was paid with cash. So the statement of cash flow can help you decide whether or not you can pay that or continue to pay that, okay? So the statement of cash flows is very important, especially internally, to be able to evaluate future operations, but it's also important externally too, whenever investors or creditors wanna look at our company to see can we, can we continue as a company, okay? Now there's three sections that the statement of cash flow is broken up into. Whenever I was studying for the CPA exam, uh, it's one of the things that they used to have all these little catchy sayings for us to remember things, but it's OIF. All right, so there's, there's three sections. And they're in a specific order. The O stands for operating activities. The I stands for investing activities. And the F stands for financing activities. All right, and the easiest way for us to, to think about this, and we're not going to go deep into this, but investing only deals with investments. Financing only deals with financing, with stocks, with uh, bonds, things like that, which we haven't really covered that. Operating covers everything else. So, you know, the daily operating activities that a business goes through, all of those things flow into the operating activities section. So that's where the bulk of the statement of cash flows take, takes place. So cash flows from or used for operating activities are the cash flows from transactions that affect the net income of the company. Now we already discussed net income. Where is net income? It's on the income statement. Revenues minus expenses give us net income. All right, so the bulk of the cash flow statement is found in the operating activity section. All right, so what does it mean when we say cash flows from or in parentheses used for? So if we have cash flows from an activity, that means that we are getting cash, right? We're receiving cash. So that's a positive number. If I get cash from Cameron, that's a positive to me. If we have cash flows that are used for operating activities, that means that we are spending cash to perform these operating activities. And if we're spending cash, then that's a negative when you think about cash, right? If I give Cameron $100, if I'm using my cash to run my business, then I'm spending cash. So in terms of cash, that would be a negative. So that's why used for is in parentheses. And you see that as well for investing and financing. So when we think about the statement of cash flows, it's all about the perception of how was cash treated in this transaction. All right. So an example for the operating activities is the purchase and sale of merchandise by a retailer. If we purchase cash, that would be used for operating activities. If we sold <coughs> merchandise, then that'd be cash flows that we would bring in. 
Okay. All right. So the way the cash flow statement looks, we start with cash flows from or used for operating activity. The next section is the I investing activities, then financing activities. Then from there, so all of our activity is condensed into those three sections. All right, so from there, we either get a net increase or a net decrease in cash. And then we take that increase or decrease and we add it to what was cash at the very beginning of the period. So on January 1st, what was the cash number that we had? And if we have the beginning cash, and then we have correctly calculated everything that happened to cash during the year, then we should end up with ending cash, right? So if you think about cash as a T account, and we know the beginning balance of cash, and then we have correctly calculated all cash inflows and all cash outflows And we take beginning cash plus or minus the net increase or decrease, then we should end up with ending cash, right? If you do it right, that's what you end up with. Okay. So that's how the statement of cash flows works. So I only want to focus today on the operating activities. Okay, because like I said, that's where the bulk of the activity happens. That's everything that we've studied in chapters one, two, three, four, and six. They would all be found in operating activities. So when we think about the statement of cash flows, we're obviously looking at how is cash impacted by this transaction. All right, so when we think about things that we've looked at over this semester, what have we looked at that would cause an inflow of cash? So for us to receive cash. It would be a sale of products. So, you know, in chapter six, whenever we sold merchandise, we received cash. Or in chapter two, three, and four, if we went out and performed a service. So, like I said with Cameron, if he cut my grass and I paid him cash, that would be a cash inflow for him. All right, and when we think about cash outflows, things that we have paid cash for, it would be to purchase inventory to pay our employees or to pay taxes. So what did we pay our cash? How did we pay our cash to run our business? So the operating activity section is fairly simple when we think about the, the different scenarios that have to happen for cash to come in or cash to go out. So let's look at operating activities, okay? So cash flows from operating activities reports, cash inflows, and outflows from our day-to-day -day operations. All right, now there's two different methods that companies can use to figure this section out. Normally, we would spend a lot of time going over these. Um, we're not gonna do that today, because there's not enough time, and um, I don't wanna give you guys a half version of it. But they're called the direct method and the indirect method. The indirect method is the way that 90% of companies calculate cash flows from operating activities. Okay. So they both result in the same answer. It's just how do you go about calculating um, cash flows from operating activities? The direct method is a little harder to calculate. It takes a little more work. So that's why most companies choose not to use that method. Um, And the reason being, so this is how you would calculate it using the direct method. You don't have to write this down. I just want to kind of talk through it with you guys. But the direct method calculates um, cash flows from operating activities this way. Cash received from customers. Cash paid for merchandise. Cash paid for operating expenses. Cash paid for interest. Cash paid for income taxes. Now, can you guys think of any problems that might cause these numbers to be hard to come by? So 
So take cash received from customers. How do you think we would solve for that? Be sales, right? So if we took total sales, would total sales represent all cash received from customers? Why not? You think yeah? If I said it was no, why would, why would you think it might be no? So how many different ways can we make a sale? We can have a cash sale. I don't sale. Know the word for it. Like I know. We can sell it on account, right? So a customer could come in and they could buy it on credit. Correct? You guys agree? Mm -hmm. So if they buy it on credit, <clears throat> cash doesn't immediately change hands. So to figure out cash received from customers, we have to go through a couple of extra steps other than just looking at total sales. So all of these numbers, and that's the same way with each of these categories. So all of these things are, it's possible to find out the amounts. It just takes extra work. And a lot of times some companies say, hey, that's not really worth it. Okay, so the direct method, while it says it's the direct method, you have to go through a lot of different steps to find out these numbers. All right, now let's compare that to the indirect method. So the indirect method reports cash flows from operating activities by beginning with net income, then adjusting for revenues and expenses that don't necessarily involve cash. So this is a lot easier method than the indirect than the direct method, and I'll show you why. This is why 90% of companies use this. Okay. So they said they start with net income. Why would net income be a good place to start? What does net income represent? Can anybody tell me that? Net profit, right? So net, net income represents, in theory, the money that we made. So you could, in a roundabout way, say that it represents the cash that we made, right? So we start with net income. What's a problem with net income? The problem is there could be expenses or revenues that are represented in the income statement that do not involve cash. And in that case, remember, we want to look at only cash-related activities for our company. So we start with net income, and then we would back out any expenses that did not involve cash, okay? So let's think of, I'll show you one. So think about depreciation, okay? So when we talked about, and this was in chapter three, it was an adjusting entry. What was depreciation? You guys remember? You go and you buy a new vehicle, you bring it home, you use it. At the end of the year, it's no longer a new vehicle. But we can't go and adjust the amount that we paid for that vehicle because of the cost concept. It has to sit on our books for what we paid for it. So we use accumulated depreciation to show the decline in value of a vehicle. And the journal entry was a debit, to depreciation expense, and a credit to accumulated depreciation. You guys remember that from chapter three? Okay. Would depreciation expense show up on the income statement? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? So yeah, it's an expense. So it shows up on the income statement. Is cash anywhere involved in this transaction? No. So it's a non-cash transaction. So this, this expense right here is falsely bringing down net income when you look at it from a cash perspective. Does that make sense? So the way that we would fix that is we would add back all these non-cash expenses. Okay, so you start with net income, you add back any, uh, any non-cash expenses, and then we would look at 
the change in current assets, okay? And without getting too deep into it, I'll give you an example of that. I'm not gonna test you on that, I just want you guys to know and have <clears throat> some knowledge of it. Okay, so let's think about accounts receivable. Can somebody tell me what is accounts receivable? Going to earn. Yeah, so it's, it's money a customer owes us, right? right? So it's a promise from them to pay us in the future. Okay, so every sale that we make on credit is a debit to accounts receivable, right? So let's say that we started the year with $100 in accounts receivable. And we ended the year with $1,000 in accounts receivable. Would you guys agree that that is an increase of $900? You with me so far? Okay. So in terms of our total assets, they've increased by $900. Think about it from a cash perspective, though. So every time that we allowed a credit sale, that was, in a roundabout way, a detriment to cash, right? So if we had done, if we had only allowed cash sales, then we would have 900 more dollars in cash. But because we allowed credit sales, we missed out on the opportunity to receive $900 in cash. Does that make sense? So using the indirect method, we would have to subtract the change in accounts receivable from net income to get to ending cash. All right, I'll, and we'll, all right, so that's, so like I said, I'm not going to test you on that, but this is the way that the indirect method works. So now let's think about it from a liability standpoint, okay? Same numbers. Let's think about it from a liability standpoint. So accounts payable. What is accounts payable? What you owe. Yeah, so it's what we owe to a, to a creditor if we go out and we buy goods on account, all right? <clears throat> so let's say that, let's say that we began the year with $100 in our accounts payable budget, or in our accounts payable ledger, and we ended the year with $1,000 in accounts payable. All right, would you guys agree that accounts payable increased by 900 bucks, okay? So our liability increased by $900. How was cash impacted by this? So if we, if we bought something on credit, that means that we had additional cash, right? So we, we held on to that cash to be able to use it to buy other things. So that $900 increase in that liability. Subtract decrease from your cash. Yeah, so it, well, it, 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 it's treated as an addition to cash. Because we didn't spend that money, we held on to that money. So we have $900 to go spend elsewhere. Does that make sense? To look at it strictly from cash. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just looking, I'm thinking about it differently, I guess, than how you're trying to actually explain it. So if you're, but all right, so all of this is from the, from the viewpoint of cash. So if, let's say that we, we spent $900. Or we, we bought $900 worth of goods. We could have paid cash and went and spent $900. Or we went and bought it on credit, and now we have $900 to go spend elsewhere. Does that make sense? But so you're you, still going to owe that. Yeah, but we're looking at it just okay. for the cash. Okay. Yeah. So I, I know it's confusing. Um, and I hate that I'm, I'm having to rush through it. But it, this part, it's not going to be tested. I just want you guys to know about the statement of cash flows. Are you confused yet? Let's look at your homework. Your homework's, it's really easy. You said that 
So this is going to be, the test next week is on specifically chapter 6 and 16, or 6 through 16? No, no, no. <laughs> just 6 and 16. Okay. And so when you think about chapter 6, we only went through, so to break it down even further, It'll be chapter six, objectives one, and objectives two. Okay. And then within those objectives, we did not talk about, um, we did not talk about, bless you. We didn't talk about, uh, let me get to it. Mm-hmm. Bless you. We did not talk about within chapter two. We didn't talk about cash refunds. Uh, we didn't talk about the different types of sales transactions. Bless you. Like if you bought it with a Visa or if you bought it with MasterCard, like the book goes into. So there's a. So it's going to be a very condensed test. So we're not going to test on that stuff? That no. Okay. Unless we covered it in class, and unless I specifically talked about the objectives in class, then it's not going to be on the test. And then within chapter 16, the main part that I want you guys to look at is objective 1. And really objective 1A. All right, so let me pull up your homework. So to do, to do your homework, there's a video. And it's the Tell Me More Learning Objective 1. And then it goes through just the part in Objective 1 that we've gone over today. So I want you guys to know the, the basic setup of the statement of cash flows. So it has three separate act sections of activities. The operating activities, the investing activities, <clears throat> and the financing activities. They're in a certain order. It's OIF, O-I-F, operating, investing, financing. Um, so yeah, it's very limited on the amount of material. You may have one or two questions from chapter 16. Okay. Hate you guys didn't get the full breakdown. I, the statement of cash flows is pretty neat. At least to me it is. You guys may not think so. Um, but the way that they calculate cash based on all of the different sections that do not involve cash is kind of it's interesting to me. So. Okay. Anybody have a question? If not, I want to spend the rest of the time going over the test prep assignment. It's not an assignment. Let me rephrase. So if you go to test number three review, and it's test prep number three. <clears throat> Do you want to know? Where is chapter six? So also within that section, there, all of uh, chapter six solutions are in there. So you know we only we only worked maybe ten problems, but there's a lot more problems that deal with the <coughs> excuse me, the objectives that we went over that I didn't have a chance to go over. So you can go back and work all of those problems, and the answers are there for you. Okay, so let's look at this. So these questions come straight from the test uh, bank that you guys test questions come from. So for Tuesday, for next week, bring your iPad. That's how you'll be tested. And um, it's going to be through lockdown browser again. So I would advise you to get here early just in case there's some kind of issue. Um, 
Are any athletes going to be out? Hopefully not. Um, so bring your iPad. You don't need any scratch paper. There will be a calculator on the screen. Um, so yeah. And you ask questions in a minute. All right, so number one. Dollar company sold merchandise to pound company on account for 25,500 bucks. The terms, they get a 2% discount if they buy within, if they pay within 15 days. If they choose not to pay within the first 15 days, then the net amount is due within 45 days. They paid the, the invoice within the discount period. What is the amount of sales from the above transactions? I'll give you guys a minute to look through that. All right. Somebody help me out. How do we solve this problem? I'm right, but what I was doing was I multiplied 25,500 by 2% mm -hmm. and then subtracted 510 from 25,000. That would be the discounted price they would have to pay if they made their payments between 15 days. You said it was 510? Yeah. All right, so 510 is the amount of the discount. And we know that they paid within the discount. I think it may be 520. Is that right? It's 510. I just heard you use a calculator. Just kidding. Oh, if I wrote the number right, then I would, that would help. 25, 5,000. All right, yeah. So if you subtract 25, 000, 25, 5 from 510, you end up with 24,990. Okay? <clears throat> so that, that's correct. That's the amount that they paid, and that's the amount that they would record for sales. All right, so I can take that same problem. So that is correct, C was the right answer. <clears throat> if you did not know, if you had no clue how to solve this problem, but you, you thought along the same lines as Cameron, so if they, if they purchased it for $25,500 and they got a 2% discount, then you could use deductive reasoning and figure out the right answer. I have no clue. Where sixteen thousand came from? Probably that would a bigger discount. be like a forty percent discount. Okay. Um, so you could automatically rule out D. Then you say, hey, if I if I paid twenty five five for it, and they gave me a discount, it's I definitely would not. You wouldn't pay more right. than the sales price. You could you could get rid of B, and then what would be the point of a discount if you pay the stated terms? So you could you could get to C a couple of different ways. All right, but let's, all right. So twenty four nine ninety is the right answer. So if I asked you the same question, and then I said journalize the transaction pound company made to purchase this merchandise and then uh, pay off their account, what would you do? Wrong, wrong answer. The first part. <laughs> All right, so let's think about it. So if you're a pound company, what are you receiving? You're receiving merchandise inventory, right? So you received merchandise inventory in this transaction. So you would debit merchandise inventory. <clears throat> and we just said, we just calculated the amount that they're going to pay. So it'd be for twenty four nine ninety. All right. So they received merchandise. How did they pay for this? Cash. It couldn't be on in cash. If it was in cash, then there'd be no reason for uh, credit terms. So they paid for it on account. All right. So they. So now pound company is going to owe dollar company. So we need to record a liability to represent that. So we would credit accounts payable. For twenty four nine ninety. All right, so we received merchandise, and in return, 
We've made a promise to Dollar Company that we're going to pay them back. Okay. So that was on the date of purchase. Now, 15 days later, we can record the payment of this liability. So 15 days later, Pound Company wants to pay Dollar Company the liability that they owe them. So we would come back. So we want to get rid of this liability. Once we pay them off, we'll no longer owe it. So you debit it. So we would debit accounts payable for $24,990. And how do you think Dollar Company wants to be paid? They want to be paid in cash, right? So we would pay them cash. So we're going to credit cash because we are spending cash to pay this liability off. So when we pay them the $24,990, we no longer have this liability on our books. So that's why we got rid of it. Okay? You guys follow the thought process? Okay? All right, let's look at number two. Number two is a little bit more involved. And if you didn't, if you don't know the answers, my advice is to work them, go through and work them. But then when you finish, I've got the answers down here, but you don't want to, if you look at the answers while you're working it, then you're kind of cheating yourself and you're not showing yourself whether or not you know how to work it. All right, so let's look at number two. I'll give you guys a second. Number two says, a sales invoice included the following information. $12,000 for the merchandise price with credit terms of a 1% discount if paid within 10 days. FOB shipping point with prepaid freight of 900 bucks. And assuming that a credit for merchandise returned of $500 is granted prior to payment and the invoice is paid within the discount period. What is the amount of cash that should be received by the seller? So we got a lot going on here. So if I were working this problem, this is the way that I would work it. The amount of merchandise that we originally bought was $12,000. <clears> we also read in the second sentence that they returned $500 worth. Okay? All right. We also see that there was a 1% discount that was offered if it was paid within 10, within 10 days. And we know that the invoice is paid within the discount period. So they took the discount. So I want to apply the discount to each of these pieces of information. All right? Hundred twenty or five? Hundred twenty. So what, is it five bucks? Is it five? I don't know. One percent of twelve thousand is. Yeah. Well, Where are you getting the five from? Five dollars. So put one percent of five hundred bucks. So they return five hundred dollars worth of goods. All right. So then you have. 11880 and then 495 So if you apply the discount, they bought $11,880 worth of goods and they sent back 495 So the amount of goods that they actually purchased is 11385 Is it everyone? You guys see how I get that? I don't know how where you got the Multiply the 500 by the 1%. So, where'd you get the 1% of 500? Technically, yes, but they want you to do it in two steps. Because 
if you got a problem where it says the $500 was sent back after they made the payment, then it would not have been, the discount wouldn't have been applied. So they want you to do it separately. All right, so we bought $12,000 $12, worth of goods. All right, right here. But then it also says, assuming that a credit for merchandise return of $500 was granted prior to payment. So we sent back $500 worth of goods. Right. I understand that part. I just don't understand where the one percent, because I see the, the terms one for 10, but I, I figured that would only. But we sent it back. One percent 10 days. But we sent it back before the payment. So if we sent it back before, it, before we paid it off, then the discount would apply to both. Okay, does that make sense? So anytime the return is, is included, you need to apply the discount to it as well. So we, we basically bought $11,500 worth of goods. Okay. Y'all with me so far? All right. So 11,5 with a 1% discount is $11,385. Now obviously that's an answer, choice, but is that the, the total amount that would be received by the seller? No. So what we need to think about before we answer that is how does shipping treat it in this transaction? Okay? Oh, so, no. FOB shipping point. FOB shipping point means that the minute these goods reach the shipping point. So the minute they're loaded onto a truck, ownership transfers from the seller to the buyer. So the entire way that these goods are in transit to the buyer, the buyer assumes ownership. Okay. And if the buyer assumes ownership while they're being transported, then the buyer can include freight costs in with the total cost of their inventory. Okay, so that $900 that is included with freight, the buyer can include that in the total cost of merchandise inventory. So they would add the 900 bucks. So the total cost that the seller is going to receive is 12,285. Okay. Where'd I lose you? I mean, you didn't after you, you worked the problem. I just, once we got to the 11385, I, I quit and gave up on the, the other 900. I didn't really even think about it. So, so that's, if this said FOB destination, then you would have been right because if it's FOB destination, ownership does not change hands until the goods reach the destination. So the buyer is not, they're not worried about anything happening while it's being shipped. So if you're, if you're not maintaining ownership during transit, then the buyer couldn't add that amount to the total cost of merchandise inventory. That's why you guys need to go back and read in chapter six. It talks about the shipping point destination and objective D, 2-D. And you can go back and listen to last week's lecture. Um, so, you guys understand how that problem works? Where I'm coming from? Okay. All right, let's look at number three. Also, I believe it's 21 questions on the test. All of them are multiple choice. But in saying that, you know, you'll have to do some math to be able to come up with the answer. All right, so number three. Well, it's, just, it's, it's too difficult on the iPad. So. All right, so number three says, Emma Company sold to Isabella Company merchandise on account, FOB shipping point. 2% discount within 10 days for 15,000 bucks. Emma Company prepaid $750 shipping charge. Using the perpetual inventory method, which of the following entries will Isabella Company make 
to record the payment from merchandise if they pay within the discount period. It's a good question. A lot going on there. All right. So what's our first step? I like to write out who the buyer is, who the seller is, and all the information that we know. You, you definitely don't have to do that, but it helps me keep everything clear. So Emma Company is the seller. Isabella Company is the buyer. Who are we looking at here? We're looking at the buyer. So we're looking at Isabella Company, who is the buyer, okay? So they purchased merchandise for $15,000. All right, one thing that's different from the previous problem, it doesn't talk anything about returns. Okay, so we're just looking at $15,000, all right? Is there a discount that's offered? Yes, 2%. 2% of 15,000 of 15, bucks is 300 bucks. And we know that they pay within the discount period. So the amount of merchandise that they purchase is $14,700. Now, how was shipping treated? You got so it was, it was shipped FOB shipping point, which means whenever Emma Company took this to FedEx or UPS or USPS, however they shipped it, ownership transferred to the buyer as soon as they took it to the shipping warehouse. Okay, so the entire time that it was in transit, it was, the, it was under the ownership of the buyer. And if the buyer maintains ownership during shipping, during transit, then they can add that charge to the total cost of merchandise. So 14.7 is what they actually pay for the merchandise, but the 750 for transit or for freight can also be added to that. So the total cost that they would record for merchandise inventory would be 15,450. Okay? So. so. Right, so the correct answer is B. The reason that A is incorrect is because it does not take into account the discount or freight. The reason D is incorrect, it only takes there's a couple of different reasons, but it did not take into account the discount. They correctly included freight, but the, the journal entry is wrong. C, the journal entry is wrong as well because they try to debit freight in, which we, did not, we didn't talk about that at all. Um, so B is the correct answer. You guys see why B is the correct answer. Anybody not see or need to go back over? All right. Let's look at number four. Number four says if merchandise sells for $3,500, with terms of a 3% discount within 15 days, and the cost of inventory sold is 2,100, the amount charged to sales is blank. So if you had 3,500 bucks, and they take a 3% discount, What about freight? So you can subtract. Well, freight, all right, so freight. 395 from 2100 and you might be freight, right? No, so freight, oh, it was a trick question. Okay. So freight's not listed in here. So, so you have to look at what's being asked, okay? So they give you some information here that's not important to the question that they're asking. All right, so all they're asking you is what amount is charged to sales, 
Okay, so if we are the seller, then all sales require two journal entries. The first journal entry is to record the actual sale. The second journal entry is to record the cost of the merchandise that we sold. All right, so the first journal entry that all sales require, so if you're the seller, you would either debit cash or debit accounts receivable, and then credit sales. So that records the actual sale. Second journal entry that, you re that is required, if you're the seller, is to document the cost of the merchandise that you sold and to get rid of the inventory that you no longer have. So you would debit cost of merchandise sold, and then you would credit merchandise inventory. So those two journal entries are required every time you make a sale. Now in this question, they are only asking about question number one. Okay. So the information they give us about the cost of inventory sold is irrelevant to the question that they're asking. It's given to us to throw you off. So the answer is A. Yeah, the answer is A. Okay. So the reason B is incorrect, it does not take into account the discount. The reason D is incorrect is it only, it's only looking at the cost of inventory sold, not what we sold it for. And then C, I, I really have no clue about C. So, everybody understand why A is correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Last, let's look at five. All right, five says, journalize the following merchandise transactions. So while I'm not, while I'm not gonna ask you guys to make a journal entry, physically writing it down, you saw from other previous problems, that you need to know the makeup of the journal entries to possibly answer some questions. All right, so on A, we sold merchandise on account for 17,300 with a 2% discount. And the cost of the merchandise sold was 12,600. So in part A, we're gonna need two journal entries. One to record the sale, the other to record the cost of the merchandise sold, okay? So 17,300. All right, so it'd be 16,954. All right, so the total cost of our sale, 16,954. So our journal entry is going to be, we're gonna credit sales because that's what we actually sold. The only problem that we have to figure out is did we have a cash sale or an account sale or a credit sale? So which do we have? We sold it on credit. So we're gonna debit accounts receivable because this is a promise from the customer to pay us. 16,954. And then we actually made a sale. So we're gonna credit sales, which is revenue. Okay. So we recorded our sale. We recorded the promise to pay from the customer. The second journal entry that we need is to record the cost of the merchandise that we just sold. So we would debit cost of merchandise sold for 12.6. And then if we sold this merchandise, that means we no longer have it in our warehouse. So we need to credit it out of inventory. So we're gonna credit merchandise inventory for 12.6 as well. All right, what, what type of account is cost of merchandise sold? Asset, liability, revenue, or expense? Yeah, it's an expense. And we know it's an expense because whenever we try to figure out profit for an actual good, you take sales, which is revenue, minus cost of merchandise sold, which is an expense, 
and we get gross profit for an actual item. All right, so that's part A. Debit accounts receivable, credit sales. Debit costs merchandise sold, credit merchandise inventory. Then part B, we received the payment within the, within the discount period. So 16,954 is the amount that we should be expecting in cash. So the customer comes in, they pay 16,954. Once they pay us that in cash, we no longer have this promise from them to pay us. So we need to get rid of accounts receivable. And we do that by crediting accounts receivable for 16,954. Any questions on that? Everybody feel good? Okay. All right. You can disregard 6010. Um, I will try and put some more questions up tonight. Send me an email and remind me about that. Um, our test is Tuesday. It's on Chapter 6. And what little of chapter 16 we covered today. Then the final, the week after that, is comprehensive. So it's going to cover chapter 1 through chapter 6. And I'll try and make a list of the different objectives that we covered. Um, so I'm not going to go back and ask you some minuscule detail that we covered in chapter 1. But the big picture items, that's what I'm going to... That's what I'm looking to test you on for the final exam.